was watching some clips of Julia Roberts' Pretty Woman and whatnot, and I got, <laughs> got caught up in a cycle of that. And I about missed the time. All right, well, good deal. Well, I think we're streaming. I don't think I gotta unhitch anything. All right, we're good. All right, well, we are here today for something. Ask me anything. <laughs> uh, yep, ask me anything. Uh, August 18th. How's it going, Rhino? I clearly don't have my head in the game at the moment. Uh, and I just rolled off screen. These two screens are so different. Go that way, right? Something I don't know. There we go. How's it going, Ultra Magnus? <laughs> Trying to get my setup. One of these days, we're gonna pull this out and get the light on the other side of the camera. Actually, we need to get a new camera. Uh, speaking of which, Chuck, do we have a link for one of those things? I got one of my son's cameras, but I never did hook it up. Eventually. Yeah. All right, Tim. You and your wilderness living. Heading back to Maine soon, maybe you'll get uh, maybe you'll get some better internet. <laughs> we'll see. Mm. Warm water, right? But yes, we are here for Ask Me Anything on August the eighteenth, uh, two thousand twenty. I suppose. I suppose that's how you end up a date. Not with a date, but you list a date. I've been married for 25 years and haven't had a date in a long, long time. <laughs> so, all right, Chuck, Chuck's throwing up the social. Uh, we're gearing up my, all kinds of things going on around TLG as usual. How's it going, Obadiah? Uh, got the, uh, how's it going, Commander Pete? We got the binder back up and running. It took a little bit of finagling to get in there and first we determined it was the compressor which we talked about last week but um, and then I had to get the new compressor in and then figure the couplings and the plug and all that mess and uh, that took a little bit of time and I've gotten to where I'm how's it going Vic how's it going OJ I've gotten to where you know we ordered quite a bit of stuff both personally and TLG that I don't know, about one in ten packages we have to return. And I try not to use Amazon. I use other services, Newegg, what have you. Um, but all of these places are wanting the original boxes and, you know, all kinds of crap. So I've gotten really careful when I open a package that, that I have shipped to me. Uh, I cut it open carefully. I set the box aside, which is very unlike me. I usually throw stuff in the trash instantly uh, and then uh, and move on. But we're holding on to this stuff now until I know that it works uh, because it's just it's too dicey they aren't they, in fact the, re, the microphone the original mic we got a couple weeks back they are not um, letting me return it I, I got I don't know I didn't include something or something I have no idea how's it going Happy, how's it going DM thank you for the subscription it's very cool you're an emote thanks to DM Samuel you got an emote thanks to DM Samuel I'm not sure what that means do I hit thank? Yeah. What? I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> I'm going to have to figure that out. Someone's going to have to explain that to me. But thank you all. How's it going, Lucid? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what I did. I just hit thank and thank at the same time. Very cool, though. But, yeah, so we're just opening up things a little bit carefully. Uh, and the compressor is one of those things. Big-ass things. So uh, took a little while to get it out and get it assembled and get it all plugged up and get the PSI set correctly so it doesn't blow anything out of the machine. And, and then I got that all done at about 9 o'clock last night, and then I went in to do some test binding because Todd was supposed to be in this morning and do a bunch of binding. And I don't know, it mucked up about four books, and I kept adjusting the PSI. And uh, We did a full run today, so uh, presumably, um, presumably we've got... A working machine again which is very very good very very good yeah and we're looking at expanding our our manufacturing capacity in the next few months uh, Tim and Davis and uh, we've been sitting down talking about what we can do and where we can go uh, what's next and uh, what gaps we can fill out there and we've got some pretty good ideas so uh, hopefully in the next I don't know near future we're able to make some pretty interesting announcements 
get me uh, one step closer to my dream of a factory with some smokestacks. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that's not, uh, that's not all cool with the environment and, and all of the global warming and whatever we're doing out there, but uh, smokestacks are just cool. <laughs> They're just cool. And of course, even what we're looking at manufacturing won't require smoke, so I'm just going to have to put like some water vapor in there so some water vapor comes out of the top or what have you. <laughs> Epi, got my Codex Egyptium the other day. Thank you. Excellent. Good deal. Uh, very happy with that one. We're rolling those things out very, very slowly, but they are. We've got about a third of them already gone, and hopefully this week and by the end of, by the middle of next week, they're all out of here. I see. So do we mostly just print your own, do you mostly print your own stuff or are used as a printer for other local companies too? Well, yes and no. Uh, we were a printer for, we did our own stuff, everything but hardcovers, and uh, we did that for years and years. We still do that to this day. We've done that since 2005. Uh, but up until about 18 months ago, maybe two years ago at this point, we did, and we outsourced. We printed for all kinds of companies all over the place, both local and other game companies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but Mark Sandy, who was my full-time print master, he went part-time. So he comes in, you know, a little bit each week, which immediately kind of killed that. I didn't really want to replace him with anyone. Uh, we gave pretty good rates on everything, and I was never 100% certain that time-wise into the machine, that at the rate that we were charging, outsourcing was worth it. Um, or uh, doing uh, printing for other clients was, was really worth it. And I didn't really want to jump up the prices because I know how difficult publishing can be. Um, so we just kind of, when, when Mark said he wanted to go part-time, we just shut that side of the business down. Uh, I think uh, we still do a little bit of work for Gary Con and a little bit of work for Gamehole Con when it calls for when they have conventions that are, that are actually people, um, you know, showing up with people. So we do a little bit, but not much. Mostly it's in-house uh, and it's our own stuff. And I have to say with as much product as we've been making in the last three or four months, it's a good thing because... Amazing Adventures 5e alone, I think there was 11 titles with that. Codex Egyptium is coming out with five extra titles with it. I mean, it's just uh, mountains and mountains of stuff. But, um, yeah, so, uh, we did, but we don't anymore. Uh, it's all coming. Let's see, which game first? Game company with a print publishing business? The game company did. We founded Troller Games in 1999. Matt Golan and I, Davis joined us, my brother, sometime around that time frame. And then we did our first printing and whatnot in the year 2000 uh, and rolled off from there. And then uh, I think what sold, it was Davis's idea actually to expand into uh, owning our own print shop. Uh, we, you know, one of the things in the early days that we struggled so much with was print costs. Uh, and this was pre-POD, so uh, we, we have to print an X amount and kind of guarantee that we sold them. And then when, um, when the, the D20 collapse occurred, that left us holding some pretty big bills without any way to pay it without, um, you know, no guarantees on sales and whatnot. So we had big print, big prints, no sales, lots of lost money, uh, about took a fall. And that's when Davis said, we, we, you know, we just need to do it this ourselves and forget the rest of this. Uh, I'm not sure what's happening here. Hype train, am I on a, am I supposed to be? I don't know what's happening. Uh, at any rate, so <laughs> there's all kinds of things going on in my feed here. Um, at any rate, yeah, so in 2005, we began investigating, and uh, later that year, we opened up the print shop, hired Mark, and he stayed with us for all those years. But um, the early printing was rough. And we, we, we did a really good job, but uh, uh, we, we kind of got hammered on the, on the agreements, on our uh, leasing agreements with the machines. But... Uh, uh, so the printing, the printing came later, 2005, and probably about 2010 is when we began taking outside clients and, and doing all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> uh, let's see, da, da 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 lots of stuff, lots of stuff. How's it going, Decimus? I've been a subscriber for 15 months. That makes me the coolest. Absolutely, Epi. <laughs> Very cool. Uh... We're losing money. <laughs> Quick buy a print shop match. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of how the, many of the decisions go on around here. <laughs> well, you know what really cinched it for me? Davis had been pitching it for a little while, 
And I was at, at, at Kublai Khan out in, uh, was it Kublai Khan? Or one of those, Genghis Khan or Kublai Khan, one of the cons out in San Francisco. And I had Lightning Source had just opened up their own POD, and uh, I needed some books out there. Uh, can't remember, it's Casey Christopherson wrote them, but I needed them anyway, so we, we did a short run at Lightning and had them shipped out there. And the bill for like 100 was, I don't know, 600 bucks and then the shipping they did an overnight and the shipping was like $300 so whatever little bit of, you know shekels I made there at the convention was wiped out um, with that ridiculous bill and that kind of sent me over the top uh, with the hiring printers to do things uh, and that's when uh, I got on board with Davis and he and I began investigating and of course in very typical Davis fashion he just turned it all over to me and said go <laughs> go figure this out uh, and, I, and I did, and I signed a poor contract in the beginning. It did really well for about four years, and in the last year, somewhere around 2009 or 10 or somewhere in that mess, uh, it, it, uh, I don't know what happened. It was with Xerox. I'm not sure what happened on their end, but the machines began messing up constantly. Uh, they wouldn't get out in time to fix them, and it backlash, I mean, it had a whiplash effect back through our production schedule. We started missing things, we started missing orders, we couldn't short print stuff. Uh, it, it was all, and we couldn't, at that time we were doing clients, we had just started clients, it was just a big disaster. Uh, we didn't lose a lot of money, but we ended up into this like six month period of horrific, no producing anything, no putting books out. Um, it was just, it was just a mess, and uh, we fired Xerox. We didn't have to go to court, but there were some legal discussions between <laughs> between us and Xerox, and we all walked away. We, we all just walked away uh, from the the contracts and called it a day. Uh, so it was, yeah, I think it was Kublai. It was a good, it was, I went to two cons out there. There's a Kublai con. Genghis Khan, I think, is in Denver, but there's another con that I went to. I cannot remember what it was. It wasn't Pacific Con. Yes, Ultra Magnus. It's, it's, it, there's the ups and the downs, the ups and the downs. But the interesting thing, we walked away um, We walked away with that experience, having a really deep knowledge on the contract side of things and all of this other stuff that goes with, um, that goes with printing. So we went with a different company called Datamax. They were fantastic, and we worked great together for many years. We're with Modern Imaging Solutions now, just fantastic little company that great service, great machines, uh, and it's just you know it's just all good. But we all can kind of speak the language, so that's uh, that's the thing. But it is funny that you make the comment, Commander Pete, that you know we're out of money, expand the business, and that's sort of what you almost have to do a lot of times uh, when you're going under. You either have to go under, or you got to get out. You know, you got to get out and change what you're doing. And that's certainly the print shop, especially those first three years, and then after we got out of the Xerox contract, uh, was insanely, absolutely insanely beneficial to the company. Um, we even expanded to a short period of time. Tim, uh, yeah, sink or swim, exactly. Tim remembers this. Um, we did hardbacks for about 18 months. We did uh, Gods and Monsters, the, the original Castle Keeper's Guide. There was 300, 350 of the, those made. Um, I might actually have one. I don't think so. Um, those were made on our presses and were really, really good books. Uh, I really liked our hardbacks, minus, um, I don't have one, but it's called Inline Binding. Essentially what you do, maybe that's the Monsters and Treasure over here. We did the M&T of A, Gods and Monsters, CKG. Ha, I bet you this is one of them. Not, it's not. Can it? So yeah, you do what's called an inline binding, and your paper is bound to the to the uh, the backing board to the to the cover itself, so that when you open it. So if you have one of the original Castle Keepers guides and you open it, every page falls beautifully flat. But we ran into this really bizarre thing, and we could never solve it with the hard covers, where we got these waves in the books. We're not sure if it was the the depth. It shouldn't have been. I mean, we're really not. We never could figure it out. And we tried everything, and eventually uh, we had to abandon. We had to abandon the hardbacking. So what is coming soon from TLG for CNC? Anything to get excited about? Absolutely, Mr. Obadiah. The uh, thing I am the most excited about is the Planescapes books uh, and the uh, Spell Compendium. Uh, those two, uh, we've been talking about those for a little while, and that is really what uh, has it going retro. 
that is really what I'm wanting to get into. And as we wrap up Gaxmore and get the shipping for Egypt down, my attention goes fully on to both of those. I haven't decided which one we're going to do first. Probably the Spell Compendium, simply because it'll be um, uh, easier and it's something the game really needs. We've got spells all the heck over the place. We've got them in uh, the Elemental Spellbook and the Player's Handbook and the Adventures Backpack. We got uh, just, they're just all the heck over the place. And I want to wrap up the Rune Lore spells. So uh, coming very, very soon, we'll be doing a Kickstarter on that. Um, and in the, in the immediate future, within the next two weeks, as soon as I get uh, a few minutes, we're going to have a, um, we're going to have Rune Lore up and on uh, the Rune Lore Adventures up and on um, Indiegogo. So uh, we got quite a bit going on. We really, we need to, everyone here at TLG needs to wrap up specifically uh, Gaxmore for 5e and Codex Egyptium and Codex Keltarum. Now this, this, the latter, the, those last two are done. They just need shipped it out of here. Uh, so that's kind of what, what the distractions are. I feel attacked. Why do you feel attacked, Jason? <laughs> Who attacked you? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm super pumped about that, especially the Planescape stuff. The, the spell book's gonna be cool. Insanely useful. Uh, very, very good. <laughs> yeah, we're almost there. Uh, very, very good. But uh, the, the Planescape stuff is something kind of new. Uh, and I was actually talking about this in the GM's Tricks the Trade I wrote and today. That it's just... Um, I don't know. There's a whole side to gaming that I think gets missed because it's hard to bring it to the table. And that's one of the things that we're going to try to do is bring it to the table uh, so that it's much easier to play. I struggle with this all the time um, when I run a Planescapes game is how to do it without having to create an entire world every Thursday evening. You know, if they go from one plane to the next plane to the next, that's three worlds you've got to create. Um, so something's got to give, I think, somewhere around in there. Uh, you could almost write a book on each one. Maybe eventually we'll do, but the idea now is a four or five page treatment with encounter charts and other various and sundry if you've looked in the Codex of Erid, you'll see. Um, I don't know what any of this means. Uh, but uh, am I supposed to be sharing this stuff, Chuck? What am I... What's going on? Uh, the... Um, what is going on now? I'm too easily distracted. <laughs> I'm too easily distracted. What was I talking about? Planescapes. Uh, yeah, in the Codex of Erid, you actually see... Uh, you actually see uh, kind of a template of stuff that we want to do that tells you how to travel and what you need and that, 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 that type of stuff. <clears throat> All right, good deal. Ah, it's too much going on. Let me... <laughs> you received a level one hype train emote only visible to you, share. Uh, so what am I doing? Am I, is it, am I frozen also? All right, hold on. I have no idea. You talk if it, if it needs it, I'll take it. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to refresh mine actually, because mine, mine seems to be, that should not impact me. That just should be the thing I'm above. Okay, all right. It's just <laughs> it's too much stuff going on in my tiny, in my tiny little brain. Uh, okay, all right. So I will ignore all of that. Good deal. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> I think the the internet's finally it's finally crapping out on us all. What whatever shall we do without <laughs> without the internet? <laughs> I tell you what we can do. I, I found this. Some of you. Now it's kind of bent, so it doesn't work well. Some of you may remember this. Was that not a cool toy, man? When I think about how we entertained ourselves in the 1970s, I think to myself, maybe we were all doing some LSD or something. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, in five notes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Jason showed up and everybody's internet froze. <laughs> Sit around the table on books and dice. Yes, there you go, Jason. <sighs> yeah, I don't know what that thing is called, but I, was, I, was, I found it in a trunk, you know, wherever, and I pulled it out and I was, 
<laughs> very hypnotizing. And I was sitting here at the desk doing it when my son walked by and he said, what is that? And I said, I don't know, something I had when I was a kid and I found it by. And he goes, that's the saddest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about those discs. <laughs> Whip and spinning top, is that what that was called? Oh, the slinkies, oh yeah. Yeah, we had some interesting toys back in back in the 1970s, even before that too, I suppose. I'm a huge fan of the, um, I, I don't collect much, but when I find really good Mark's toys, the, the tall Vikings and Knights and Cowboys, I got a couple over here on the wall. Let's see if I can snatch one without knocking over everything. But, uh, let's see that. This is about all that's left of my Viking. So there's this guy. So <laughs> Look at that sharp looking hat, man. What, what kind of woman doesn't like a sharp dressed man? <laughs> so <laughs> Good stuff. They just, Marks, the Marks Brothers, not brothers, the Marks Toy Company made fantastic toys. They really did. Uh, it's one of those things I've always wanted to be able to make toys. Not sure toys actually sell anymore like they did when we were kids. There's different forms of entertainment, but uh, uh, certainly the Marx the Marx folks made some absolutely fantastic toys. He looks slightly concerned. Yeah. <laughs> Slinkies are still a thing. My buddy bought his fine. Well, that's good. Slinkies are still hanging on, huh? Oh yeah, the jacks and marbles. Oh my God, I played marbles like crazy. Uh, at Fort Campbell, we had this centerpiece, uh, whatever island we call it, and we all, we man, that thing was just dirt. Us kids were on that island every day shooting marbles and playing <laughs> jarts, and those things were huge. <laughs> Surprised more people didn't just get killed. <laughs> no, they don't. Those toys, <laughs> those toys were a thing of the past. I'm not sure jarts were a good idea. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. All good stuff, though. Yeah, so it's very different these days. Um, it's, it's very, very different how the whole... Uh, the market. I mean, I, I guarantee you had video games been as cool now as they were in the 1970s, our asses would have been sitting in front of, the, in front of the computers and what, and not blowing stuff up, playing army men or whatever, because that's essentially all they're doing. They're just a little bit less physical. But I really don't know how physical dark or marbles is or jacks. I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's insanely physical. But... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right. Charts were a great idea. Yeah, just, I, you know, we had them, and I, I don't know anyone that ever got stabbed or wounded with a jart. Uh, Brad Bevington got a brick upside his head, and he bled like a stuck pig, but I don't I don't remember the jarts actually ever <laughs> hurting anybody. I slip on the slot. There you go. I had a friend throw a regular dart at me during a heated attendee game when I was a kid. The entire point was embedded in this. Damn, that probably hurt. <laughs> Yeah, that's not good. The worst I ever had was dice hurled at me. No, no darts were thrown in my direction. Thank goodness. <laughs> that's a way to put someone's eye out. All right, good deal. <laughs> just, you know, it was just a different time. I guarantee you. Uh, what did my dad say? I can't. Now I'm going to mess this up. Um, he said something like, "I only put two kids' eyes out with corn cobs." And he said that as if it was just a matter of th something people did, because they used to have, back in the 1940s, they used to have corn cob fights. And I don't know if you, if you know this, but a corn cob, once it dries up, it's pretty stout. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a pretty, little, pretty good little missile. Uh, so apparently they had corn cob fights, and I guarantee they would look at us with our jarts and our, our tall Vikings and think, man, when I was a kid, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I once ignited the gas in a storm drift and it made you, there you go. Yeah, now I was, I, we lived on post, so I never had much, there wasn't much firecrackers in our few, you know, we, there was no buying and bringing firecrackers on and, uh, we, we, my dad is in the army, so, uh, <laughs> there was none of that. Uh, good times, though. We used to have pellet gun wars. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's just a different, it's just a different time. Um. I don't know. It's just very, very weird. Of course, now if you remember too, in the '70s, if you want to, if you want to break the nostalgia with it, 
Um, there was a lot of kidnappings, a lot of children murdered. <laughs> it was all kinds of crazy. The 70s were crazy, man. I mean, New York City was a disaster of biblical proportions. The mafia was killing people all over the place. Crime was up. Through We had serial killers just running amok. Who's that knucklehead out in Kansas killing people? And Ted Bundy was wandering around killing people. Just, just people getting killed all over the place. Oh, yeah, we blew up a few G.I. Joes. We, we grew up next to a creepy cemetery and we had BB gun wars. Good times, yep. <laughs> Told me that that juvenile delinquents in this day would throw chains into a power line city. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. I don't know. The 70s were very, very... And the 80s, too. Now, it, it calmed down, I think, and then that, after that one kid got killed, and then, then his father went on to do the show. Okay, Adam? Was it Adam? I think he was the first kid on the milk cartons, I think. Things began to change about then, I th if I remember correctly. People started to get a little bit more nervous um, and, and a little bit... I saw this great chart a few years back that... And it was it took it from like 1910 to today. Well, to whenever I saw the chart. <laughs> Ten years ago, whatever that was. Uh, and how far children were allowed to roam from home. And back in like 1910, it was miles and miles. I can't remember the exact chart said, but it was like 10 or 12 miles or some shit like that. Uh, if not a lot further, and and it, sh it kept shrinking with each passing decade up until today, it's like a hundred yards or something like that. Adam Walsh, that's the guy. Um, I would want to go back to those times any time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's um, potato guns. I had a friend had his eyes lacerated with a potato gun. <laughs> it just exploded and shit just cut his eyes up. Um, good friend of mine. I also had. I, I will say this. Uh, I was eight or nine we were at fort leavenworth and i was at the pool late one night i was like i said young and i was playing with this kid i just met we hung out a little bit and i remember we waited for our parents to come get us and um i got in the station i said goodbye to him got into a station wagon. my mom went home the next day there was you know mps all over looking for this kid they came and talked to me and uh he had been um scooped up by someone and brutally brutally murdered uh by this other kid and then buried in a ditch somewhere so the 70s had they had their slinkies and potato guns but there was another side to them that wasn't so cool <laughs> i mean one of my friends uh, found, out, found out that when he set green army men on fire the dripping plastic made an incredible whizzing noise as it fell so many army men had a horrible fate that day your army men were introduced to napalm apparently <laughs> so it turned yeah i used to shoot my bb gun at those army men all the time all the times Sometimes I think kids today really miss out on some good times because of the sheltering they get. Then it occurs to me that I'm probably lucky to be alive. <laughs> There's probably, it's a mixed bag there, Jason. I think both of what you say is, is good. You, you didn't get your eye put out by a corn cob nor burn off a finger or something, but uh, <clears throat> AMA drinking game. Take a shot every time Steve cusses. I, <laughs> I think I've gotten more, more relaxed. The more relaxed I get, the more I cuss. It's a habit I wish I could break. It's just not a good habit to be in, but uh, yeah, I tend to I tend to cuss a little bit. I read the twenties had high amounts of child abduction and murder. I, yeah, I think so. I think um, <laughs> don't twist feel good stories. Yeah, I mean that's one of those things we always like to look back, right? And it's always better. Except Tim. Now I will say this for Tim: he never looks back. He never waxes nostalgic about anything. <laughs> and when you talk about the past, he usually can't remember it. And he, it's not that he drank or did LSD or anything. He just doesn't give a shit. So he doesn't. They are cussed again. He, he just doesn't care, so he, he doesn't pay any attention to it. But when you wax nostalgic, when you actually look back at those times, eh, there's probably a give or take. You know, <laughs> there, There's some good and there's some bad. In the 70s, I had a paper route across town. Rode my bike six miles all day, all along. Thought nothing of it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. We zipped around on our bicycles everywhere. Uh, and I don't really remember. The only restriction I had, if I recall, was I had to be home at six for dinner. That was it. If I did not, if I was not home for dinner, I did not get any dinner. And there was no snacking at my house. There, there wasn't cupcakes and Twinkies and that crap. There was dinner and then there was breakfast the next morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'm a scout leader. When I look back at my own scouting days, imagine what I'd do if I caught kids doing these days. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it usually is. True story, I found an old newspaper from the 20s in my parents' attic. Their house was in the 1800s. And the front page story was, wait for it, about a school shooting. Oh, yeah, school shootings are nothing new. I remember reading an article a few years, <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, it's, yeah, no, it's nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing new under the sun. 
But it's not, you know, the thing about nostalgia, we always want to wax how great it was. Um, I, Because I, I remember I, I was talking to Wilson, my youngest, about things that we did because I was making fun of him for playing a video game. And I said, get outside, go do something, whatever. And he's like, what do you want me to do? What did you do? What did you do when you didn't know anyone? And I said, well, mostly I sat around staring at stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> There was a whole lot of sitting there. I don't know we don't remember it that way, but there was a whole lot of just sitting there, uh, sitting there doing nothing. I, re- I recall the stories my grandparents used to tell me about the 20s, 30s Chicago. My grandpa actually witnessed the St. Valentine's and that's got his way home. Good God. Yeah, I mean, that's it, Blood Wild. You're right on. I mean, it's uh, things calmed in the 80s tremendously. I say that. There was still a lot of serial killing going on. And then, in, I guess, in the 90s and the aughts, but... At some point, there's, I don't know, there's a bunch of Ridland involved, or is that it? Ridland, was that the stuff? I don't know. Uh, at the end of the day, there's always mayhem outside the door. Just always. Um, and a lot of it, probably, if we were to look at it from an anthropological point of view, uh, people are having children at an older age. And when you hit, what, 25, 35, I guess probably, probably in your 30s, when you hit into your 30s, definitely by the 40s, you are far more aware of your mortality and how much things actually hurt. So <laughs> you don't want, you when you watch your children doing it, you know, it, it's just not something you want to see. I remember years ago now when my oldest was itty bitty, I was over at my sister's house and one of her friends was there and her friend had had, so I'm 33 or four, I don't know, whatever. Uh, her friend had had a child very young and like when she's 16 and the kid's like five at that point or some shit I can't remember and this kid skinnies up into way up into this tree that I could tell was not it just wasn't stout enough to hold the weight of this kid uh, and I made a comment to Nikki said he's fixed to fall out of that tree and Nikki just laughed that's my sister Nikki she just laughed and then the other the kid's mother laughed too and sure as shit that kid that, he got up there, branch broke, and he didn't fall all the way to the ground, but he fell, I don't know, 10, 15 feet, something crashing before he got a hold of himself. And I had an epiphany. I thought, uh, this young lady's only 21 or 19 or whatever the heck she is. And she doesn't she doesn't know about mortality yet. She hasn't learned that side of things. So she's letting her child do these crazy things. But um, <laughs> there, there you go. Uh, yeah, grass is always green as in hindsight. Absolutely. It kind of explains why RPG games got so popular. Something our parents could let's do that probably... Yeah, exactly. We're not breaking anything. We're not uh, running amok. We're not, you know, whatever. We're just sitting at home playing these games and, and hooting and hollering. And, you know, I didn't know... I know a lot of people that played. Uh, I didn't know anyone... I don't know there was this whole satanic panic and all of this crap. But I don't know... It, of course, now I grew up on an army post, so it was a little different. I don't know anyone that panicked about that. No one's parents got on to him for playing D&D. No one gave a crap. My barber is an old Italian guy, and his shop is populated by old Italian guys who have no qualms with telling stories about running numbers for Uncle Vito when they were 10. Sometimes it's a little scary, mostly, though. It's just, yeah, it's pretty cool. But there's another side to that running numbers. <laughs> there's some dude with a split head. <laughs> sing, sing alone with your own thoughts is a highly underrated. <laughs> but, you know, I tell you, that's the mark of somebody if you can sit quietly. And your own thoughts, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Put, leave the phone away, and just go. And even if you're not thinking about anything, even if you're just sitting there, mostly brain dead, it's perfectly okay. Uh, perfectly okay. <laughs> it's something you should be proud of. I'm about to turn 39, and I got another on the way. Freaked out, and then I said, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, when you're 20, you don't freak out. But we're all older and having kids, and you, as you get older, you're just aware of things. You're aware of the mistakes that you made and the pain and, and all of that. You know, I watch a lot of YouTube videos of just people doing stupid crap, and the ones where someone actually is running and falls, uh, especially on their butt, I can feel it. I can actually feel it because I've fallen enough, you know, my bicycle, my skateboard, my tricycle. I remember all of these things and I can just, this jolt of, you know, <laughs> memory goes through me like, ah, it's going to hurt. <clears throat> but eh, that's the way it is when you get, you start getting a little bit older. I'll pretend my water is dust. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes. Jason, it's only 7.30. If we keep this up, it will make work very interesting today. <laughs> my English teacher tried to warn my parents with the whole satanic panic thing. My parents just asked me to explain explain the game that I dropped. Yeah, my, I don't think my parents ever even mentioned it. My mom's the one who got us into the game. She bought all of these books from a soldier that was deploying a hardship tour to Korea and gave it to Davis, and he started playing. I don't, it never 
that comic books movies. I, my mom and dad didn't. They didn't panic about much of anything. Of course, they were young. <laughs> they were much. I think she had my oldest brother when she was eighteen, so she would have been what five years, six years later, whatever the heck that is, twenty four when she had me. Uh, so they were very young when they, they they weren't aware of their own mortality. I've got this great picture of them, yeah, very very young. Um, I think Dad had just gotten back from Vietnam. I'm pretty sure he hadn't, and he was. You could they had just begun traveling, and you could see this this contempt for the world. And looking at that picture, I understood why we were baggage wherever they went. We were just baggage. Yeah, they loved us and all that crap, but we were baggage. <laughs> they had things that they were doing. It's pretty cool marriage. It lasted 59 years. So that's a pretty good score. Sundays I turn off my computer and just read and walk. Yeah, it's a good idea, Lucy. It's a very, very good idea. I try not to go to the computer at all on the weekends. I do, invariably, but I try not to. Because uh, it's just, yeah. And, of course, my phone is, yeah. Uh, I don't have kids. I just buy hand soda blasters. <laughs> okay, there you go, Jason. <laughs> Carry on. I remember frozen. I try to let my kids have a lot of freedom to do stuff and sometimes get mildly hurt. I do, too. Now, I will tell you this. I will tell you this. Davis, my brother, who you all know, is the co-designer of Castles and Crusades. He's older than me by two years or such, and he's got no qualms about his children hurting himself. None whatsoever. Go to his Facebook feed. You'll see all kinds of crazy pictures. He puts them on boards and sends them out into ponds. Uh, I saw Henry was out there the other day shooting a bow. He holds his bow and shoot compound bow, shooting it straight up in the air. And me and both of my sons are like, what are you doing? And Davis is going, well. <laughs> it's like, good Lord. So his, Davis is like he's, he's 20 years old. <laughs> it's great. Those kids are tougher than nails. I'll give them that. Bumper shines, grabbing the rear bumper of a passing car in winter. <laughs> Never had enough snow to do that, but that's that sounds like a very Canadian thing to do there, Willie. <laughs> kids need the freedom to learn. They do that, absolutely, Commander. You, they got to hurt themselves. If you're a young parent, let your kids hurt themselves, because if they don't, you're going to regret it by the time they're teenagers. Uh, pain is a, it's, it's a very good focus thing. We sometimes played D&D in my living room, so my parents knew exactly what we were doing, so they didn't give in and say, panic, panic, like they might have. Yeah, I don't, I don't, it's weird. I ran into it, the first time I ran into it as a kid, I was at a gas station, and I went in to go to the bathroom, and there were some of those leaflets, you know, the little uh, the booklets. Were they, it was a booklet, right? Whatever they did. Sitting on the back of the commode, and I picked it up going, what is this, you know, and read it and showed Davis, and then somehow, sometime in the future, six months, a year later, I don't know, we started getting it in the mail. And Davis and I have talked about this. The only thing I can think about, the only thing I can figure out why that happened, because we didn't, it's not like we put our address out there, but Davis used to order from a, we were both big comic collectors, and Davis was, uh, of course in those days we weren't collectors, we were just comic readers, and we just bought lots of comic books. Uh, Davis ordered a lot of comic books from Mile High Comics out in Denver, Colorado, which I think they're still in business. I was in their shop not long ago, but uh, about five years ago. But in those days, they were a great mail order service for comic books. And all I can think of is that somehow their mailing lists got in, you know, those, whoever did those little booklets, the little religious booklets. Uh, but uh, yeah, then we started getting crap in the mail. I still got some somewhere around here. It's a couple of the things that they sent us that were going to hell. Cool stuff. You know, whatever, man. <laughs> whatever gets you through the day. <laughs> uh, let's see, men have stories about my mom's three-day concerns about this headache panic, but they take too long to relate here. <laughs> yeah, we managed to... It, it sounds like most of us managed to avoid that. Honestly, don't recall it, every everything I had, but my mom threw all my D&Ds in the wood stove. <laughs> oh, that sucks! <laughs> oh, blood wow, that's horrible. That's horrible. <laughs> that's, that's no good. Yeah, it happens though. I mean, sometimes. Uh, like I said, my parents. Oh, Vic, I missed something. We did that. I missed what you said, Vic. Uh, let's see, what are we doing here? My mom gave me a book she'd picked up that included Metallica on a list of black metal bands. I gave her the lyrics to Creeping Death, which is about the book of Exodus. That ended her concerns. Yeah, I listened to Johnny Cash in those days, so I don't think. <laughs> I, was, I was a big country fan. Even so, my parents didn't give a crap. I mean, I've got, I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. i got all these old eerie pu uh, puzzles and eerie magazines and epic magazines and heavy metal. That stuff was all over our room, and my parents just didn't care. I didn't get to play proper RPG sessions until university, but was interested in the idea. In my mid-teens, had a, had a notion I'd enjoy it. Yeah, well, you, you've joined it, and it's an awesome hobby. It is definitely that. My youngest just dove into it pell-mell this week. 
Uh, and he's been on World Anvil, of all places. I walked by and he had the World of Air to up. And I said, hey, what is that? He goes, it's World Anvil. It's on your site. Very cool. <clears throat> I started playing AD&D in 79 at the age of five in my grandparents, grandma's basement with my uncle who was in high school at the time. Oh, that's very cool. Not even close that genre. Who wrote that book? Not even close that genre. I see. Like, I'm... Jack Schick comic. Oh, there we go. Jack Schick. Schick tracks. The religious book list things. Horrible little text. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Oh, black metal, there you go. I think the satanic panic in the 80s was more... I, you know, yeah, definitely, Jason, definitely. And it's become legendary now, of course. None of us that even got this stuff cared. I mean, I don't know anyone. I don't know anyone that got punished except Blood Wild, clearly. <laughs> Blood Wild was one of the casualties. <laughs> Without a doubt. Oh, that's funny. They're still up. That is awesome. I'll have to go check that out. I don't recall who wrote the book. It's called Satanism, the Seduction of America's Youth. There's all kinds of that stuff in the 80s. You know, the movies were getting kind of crazy and gory and all kinds of stuff, the 70s and 80s. And, of course, the 70s, shit was going crazy now. I mean, cocaine was blowing through the country like madness. Uh, Pablo Escobar was building his empire, and whatever knuckleheads had introduced it into Florida and Los Angeles, and it was spreading across the country. The mob was absolutely on crack, running around, shooting people all over the place. When did the mob get busted up? Like, 80... 88, 89, so the 70s, the mob is at the height of their game. Um, and then if you look at New York City, and I'm sure the other cities are just as bad, but uh, prostitution, the peep show, strip joints, illegal gambling, massage parlors, just, I mean, drugs all over the place. The whole country in the 70s, uh, you know, it was, it was a wild, wild time. It was a lot of, and of course, Vietnam had just ended and, uh, everyone's trying to figure out which way that this is going and that is going. The 70s was a very different time. So this reaction that people are having, uh, concerned about Satanism, trying to understand why there's so many kidnappings and uh, why these kids are getting molested and, and why there's so many bloody serial killers all over the place. You know, it's it's uh, it sometimes defies explanation. So, <laughs> so they don't figure it out, you know. I encountered Chick Tracks online university again. I sent an email to their website complaining about them and actually got a reply. Oh, that's cool. Was it a, was it a nice reply? The only books I recall that were burned were the DMG and Deities and Demigods since their covers were evil. Oh, man. That Deities and Demigods probably worth a lot of money now. <laughs> Satanic Panic was uh, deaf real here in Sweden. They talked about it in, on State Division. Definitely real here in Sweden. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. I don't ever remember it being on TV for us. Uh, I know the Guy Gaxes were interviewed. 60 Minutes? Is that on, on one of those news channels? But I don't ever remember it like... But again, I was on a military post. Things were very different, I think, in the civilian world and the military post. We, I don't know. I don't remember any of it. As a guy who was playing D&D in the 80s and became a Christian during that time, the number of times I had to explain to people that I wasn't performing any rituals, just telling stories and having fun. Yeah, I know, man. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, that, and that's the, one of the hard things. I, whenever I did have to talk about Dungeons & Dragons to people... Uh, it, it, it's rare that you play evil. Mostly, you're killing evil. Mostly, the purpose of the game is to just get gold. But it's you're killing evil. Orcs are evil, and well, they might not. In later versions of the game, they might have changed. But <laughs> generally speaking, evil is evil, and you go and kill it. Ah, oh, that's cool. World animal looks like a great stuff. Yeah, it's funny that he was on. It's just cracking me up. You mean when Gotti went down? Uh, that was the late '80s. Yeah, Gotti. Gotti. He killed. One of the mob bosses and one of the most famous hits in history because it's right there on the streets of New York. The mock, uh, Costa, Costa, Costanello, Costa, Costa something, <laughs> not Costa Nostra, but Costanello. I, I'm not very good with Italian names. Uh, gun down there in the streets, and that's like '87, '88, uh, and then Gotti gets on top. But in the '70s, the mob owns you know huge swaths of New York City. The mob owns the drug store, the drug trade. The mob owns stuff out to Kansas City out to Las Vegas. The mob is everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. And it was powerful. And they were killing lots of people. Um, the 70s was a crazy time. A friend's wife is from the same neighborhood as Gotti, Oxygen Park, I think. Apparently it went downhill after he was arrested. Yeah, the mob is pretty much gutted, hard gutted in the late 80s, I think. And by the early 90s, they're pretty much... I'm, I'm stir They're still there. They're still mob families, but they changed. And from what I understand, they've completely changed their MO from being kind of overt to being very, very like they were in the 1930s and 20s. Very, well, I guess they weren't in the 20s and 30s. But just very quiet, secretive, and staying out of the limelight. <clears throat> yeah, that's probably the one, Jason. It was probably on Donahue or Sally Jesse. I can't recall. 
Yeah, it was it, it was that it was that there because Gary's trying to defend. I think that was after some kid, the tunnel incident in Chicago where the kid goes out trying to do the tunnel tunnel or whatever. Da, 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 da. They just sell books. <laughs> Are you talking about the mob? <laughs> Gaming pop culture and history all in one show. Yeah, there you go. There you go for a while. But it is, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, whatever, uh, defend these shit guys, but the chick guys, whatever their company's called. But, you know, in those days, everyone was trying to explain stuff uh, because things seemed like they were going haywire um, pretty quick. And um, it probably had a lot to do with a lot of drugs on the street. <laughs> when does Escobar kick in? It's the 70s, right? Because he's the one that, you know, makes cocaine production kind of corporate. And he starts pumping. I can't remember how much it is. I know he's huge in the 80s. But I'm, I'm pretty sure in the 70s is when he gets, when he starts to flooding the market with cocaine. So uh, it's just crime is through the roof. We had the Castro emptied the prisons, if you recall. That might have been in the 80s. Though. When did Castro in? No. No, that was the 70s. I can't remember. 70s, 80s, around in there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so the times were crazy, and everyone was trying to explain what's causing what seemingly society is unwinding. And, you know, in some respects, you can see that today. There's so much stuff going on from the Black Lives Matter protests, Black Lives Matter protests, to, to the Antifa protests, to, uh, you know, obviously the COVID mess, and then you've got just all kinds of things going on, all these riots and crime spiking in places like Baltimore and uh, Chicago and blah, 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 blah. And you're, so you, you, you wonder, you're looking at society, what's causing this? You're trying to find a solution for it. And a lot of times uh, it's multiple solutions. But I can say this, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to get caught up defending the chick people, and so I will say this, um, I can categorically say, I think, with some level of assurance that Dungeons & Dragons did not cause the mayhem of the 1970s. <laughs> I do not think Gary Gygax's creation of the game in 1970-whatever to led to... Though, that is interesting timing, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't think the TNT had anything to do with it. Ah, there you go. He funded his cartel in '76. Yeah, there you go. So he's he's pumping drugs into the United States by the by the '70s and by the '80s. It's crazy. So it was. There was a a, a whole lot of. Uh, it's an ODD in '74. Yeah. So uh, you know, things go crazy. I don't know. The world was changing. Everything was changing. Um, Cold War full on. The West. You know, we're coming out of the uh, explosive period of the. 1950s and 1960s and all of that wealth that was generated uh, with the reindustrialization of the United States, just explosive amount of wealth, it spills across the country in the 70s, drugs come in from the south, they become extremely cheap, and this just kind of all bundles together with, um, what, a generation, for the first time, a generation of people who aren't getting married young, this is the boomers, and the boomers are out trying to find whatever it is they're doing. But jobs are changing. Manufacturing is beginning to erode a little bit. People are going to college. They're experimenting. All kinds of stuff. Throw in the Vietnam War and the terror. Blah, blah, blah. All of this stuff. And you've got this kind of almost a perfect cauldron of madness that, that is the 1970s. That we all grew up in. <laughs> it was so, so very much fun. Question. Have you thought about doing an online convention? Goodman Games and Frog God did something in the past and I think... Uh, they're planning a future weekend for gaming. Wondering if something that Troll Lords might something Troll Lords might do. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely we talk about it all the time, uh, and really that's in Chuck's bailiwick. He's going to have to kind of organize it, and then we got to figure out when my schedule is clear so that I can be a part of it. Uh, but we definitely, definitely want to do that. Um, it just makes sense all the way around. Uh, bring Troll Trollcon back and get back to uh, you know where we all can kind of meet on a, a more. A regular basis, you know, at least for the weekend and whatnot, as opposed to what we're, you know, when we meet here on AMA. But yeah, definitely right now. That's definitely in the dock. Uh, it, it's part of part of the structural issue, organizational issue that we're having here in TLG. We've had enough growth in the past three years, uh, and we lost a vital employee with Mark. I mean, he comes in part time, but it's, it, you know, going from forty to five to ten is is tough. Uh, so. And then, of course, with Chuck and Tim's building World Anvil and 
and Discord and all of these other new avenues that we're expanding into and out of and then throw in the COVID mess and all of the, the uh, interruptions that that's caused, for, which isn't much for Troller Games. We've done pretty well sheltering ourselves from all of that and, and keeping things going forward. But it's disrupted daily lives, specifically Davis Chenault, my brother. He's, his has been the most uh, disrupted, disruptive, but disrupted. Um, but uh, so things like the convention, there's so many things that we are working on, so many things that we want to do, uh, so many stuff that we need to do that the convention becomes, the online convention becomes one of those. And it just, at some point, there'll be a sudden shift in focus, and that's what we'll be talking about, and then we'll start putting that together. Hopefully soon. As soon as we can get Gax more in Egypt off my desk, I'll have a lot more time. Disco was the true source of evil. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that, that might have been it. That And see, that's another crazy part of it. When you look at the 70s, there's this explosion of just, I don't know, the wide collars too. What's up with those wide collars? Uh, I don't know. The 70s is a crazy time. If you don't know much about it or if you were really young in the 70s, I'm sure Netflix, they've got a ton of documentaries on decades go watch them they're cool i mean the 70s is a crazy time just an absolutely crazy time a recent talking crit episode was about online cons some really interesting stuff people are, are doing it to distinguish them from just a bunch of online sessions well now that's interesting i scribble those ideas down decimus whatever was brought up send it to chuck or tim and uh that'd be interesting because that's obviously one of the things that we would want to do is do something a little bit different other than just you know zoom meetings and gaming um that's good to hear. I prefer CNC, so I was hoping TLG would put something together for a weekend of online games. Yeah, it's definitely been intent. I, I know that we had talked once about doing quarterly, but um, you know how it is. Uh, I couldn't call. Uh, TNG, both, what am I, both of my in-person groups are meeting again. I'm solid. Excellent. There you go, Jason. I wasn't even born until halfway through the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> 70s were pretty crazy. Very, very interesting time. Um... I didn't exist in the 70s. <laughs> that 70s show is exactly how it really was. <laughs> that 70s show is pretty cool. I like that show. But there's this side, and, and the funny thing about the 70s show is, of course, it takes place in the heartland in Wisconsin, so it's not where, the, where all of the madness was going. But um, I don't know. It was an interesting, I, I, it was just very interesting. And, of course, we didn't know any better then, right? I mean, this was just the world that I grew up in. This is what it always was, and it always had been. Of course, it hadn't always been this way, but... Uh, uh, but there you go. Or did the 70s not exist without you? There you go, Bloodwild. That's <laughs> that's the way to turn it around. <laughs> the 70s that blow my mind is seeing a stable Middle East <laughs> and America's vacation there. Yeah. yeah, that thing went out with, what, probably Anwar Sadat's uh, assassination in 81, I think. Uh, that's when that it's done, and the Middle East is just... Um, the 70s was actually interesting. It's funny, you should bring that up, 42. The 70s was a very peaceful time in the Middle East. The 60s, not so much, but the 70s for the most part. Of course, Israel had just won three brutal wars against you know a variety of Arab states, so uh, that probably calmed it down for a little bit. And I know Jordan got out of it, too. Jordan basically said, listen, and Egypt, too, we're not, we're not doing this anymore. Um, because they bore, Jordan and Egypt bore the brunt. Iraq did a little bit, Syria somewhat, but Egypt bore the real brunt of those wars. Um, I've only seen episode one of the 70s shows. I started watching it and I said, there you go. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good. I like the 70s show. Now, there's a movie, um, if you kind of want to get a, a, a different view of it, you, you'll have to look up the title. It's about the guys, the two guys who created Mad Magazine. It's on Netflix, I think, uh, and it's about the one main guy who did it. Very good movie. Uh, and you'll see people like Chevy Chase and Jim Belushi, not the actual people, but actors playing them, kind of come through the Mad Magazine offices because they all worked for Mad Magazine at one point or the other. Very good movie, and it give you kind of an idea of what, I don't know, just the craziness that was going on. Everything was just going, I don't know. The 70s was an interesting time. Uh, I have I had a lot of fun in the 70s. I was very young. I was born in 67, so, uh, you know, I can remember it, skateboards and all that crap, but... Uh, Clearly, I wasn't killed or anything, so that's a good thing. It was good fun. <clears throat> Are you thinking of a stupid feudal just... I think that's it, Jason. Uh, National Lampoon, you're right. Not Mad Magazine, you're right. National Lampoon, yes. Very good, very good movie. I, I highly recommend it. It gives you kind of an idea. You know, just a little bit of a taste of the other side of things. Because L.A., you know, New York was this mafia bastion of crime and whatnot, but L.A. had its own issues. I mean, out on the West Coast, it was just as crazy. Uh, out up northwest, there were serial killers all over the place, and 
I don't know why that is. I don't know what's going on in Washington and Oregon, but uh, crazy times. It's good. Movie. It's very, very, very good. Uh, very good flick. Uh, I vacationed in the Middle East. Of course, I was heavily armed, and so were all my friends. <laughs> yeah, vacation. Is that what you did, Vic? <laughs> you vacation. Yeah, it's not been peaceful since. Uh, and I'm not sure. I'd have to ask Davis. Davis is much more attuned to Middle Eastern history than I am. But I, I vaguely remember Anwar Sadat. Sadat, he's assassinated in 81, I think. He's the president of Egypt. Uh, and it begins to shift after that um, into this, you know, a lot, of, a lot of conflict in the Middle East, an awful lot of conflict. All right, so Chuck is sending me. We're almost done for the day, which sucks again. I, I really enjoy this panel we do or this whatever gathering we do. Uh, today apparently was walk down memory lane, but... Uh, we got a lot of announcements, so I'm just going to read these, Chuck. There's no way I can memorize all that, so I'm just going to read it, Chuck, so I hope that you wrote what I'm supposed to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Vic, if you, if you aren't aware, anyone who's not aware, 50% uh, off for all veterans. So you just send us an email, we'll get you hooked up with the code, and you're good. If you're a veteran, just give us a shout. Um, read slowly. <laughs> Uh, hey, questions about game stuff, the F-Series adventures, are they all one-offs, or do they all form one long campaign? They very loosely form a campaign, so you can, you can do them as one-offs, but they are kind of one campaign. But like I said, you can easily do it, um, either way. So, and Goblins of Mount Shadow, I think, is the strongest in that series. There's five, I think, in that series, and Goblins of Mount Shadow. Is Goblins of Mount Shadow? Yeah. Very good, very good adventure there. To be fair, the region has been troubled on and off for a very, yeah, for a very long time. It's the fulcrum, right, of African and European and Asian civilizations, and they come together here. You, it's just uh, <laughs> no, not, not so much, Mr. Obadiah. Uh, it, but the Middle East is just a fulcrum, and it's a, a huge place where stuff moves, <laughs> moves everywhere. Are there many veterans in chat this evening? Uh, all right, so while we're answering Decimus, uh, I'm going to read these announcements. All right, I'll read slowly, Chuck. I'll read slowly. Let's see. Lamentations of the People is free on OBS Today only. Uh, Chuck is going to post a link to that. So Lamentations of the People is free today over on OBS, so make sure you go get your copy. Uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday at 7 p.m., uh, the Haunted Holler painting. So we're doing miniature painting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Definitely join us for there, for that. Um, who's, who's doing that? I can't remember his name. Uh, Hardy. Uh, yeah, haunted, haunted Holler Painting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Oh, we never did decide the day. Uh, well, let me ask you guys. So, um, we're going to do GM's Tricks of the Trade either on Thursday or Friday. I'm on the road on Thursday and won't be back until 3. And that's assuming there's nothing awry, nothing goes awry on the road. Is a Friday show something you guys would attend? Or what, should we just stick with the... Thursday show, and I make sure I make it back Thursday. So that's for GM's Tricks of the Trade, and we're doing a pretty cool one this year. We're doing this day, this week. Uh, we're doing uh, five RPG supplements that influenced me the most. Daniel Fisher, there it is. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> I'd love to see and play in some CNC Living World type campaign. Some of that Paizo was done with the Pathfinder side, just a great way. Now that would be very cool. Athelstan. Athelstan. I love that name. Uh, I see Saturday, 10 a.m., Chuck Kumbo returns with the Haunted Highlands. He will be running his game 10 a.m. Central Standard Time on Saturday. Uh, and thank you all for the subs and the follows. We sure do appreciate it. Uh, spread the word about the channel if you can and let us know. But uh, So I'm not sure on the, the GM's Tricks of the Trade. Uh, I'm more inclined to move it to Friday. It's simply because... Um, you know, you know how it is when you. I got a three-hour drive back down the mountains on Thursday, and any number of a gazillion things could get in the way. To um, Ethelstan Hawk, when I organized plays, and him. anything, either night is fine by me, so long as my games don't overrun. Yeah, so we're. I'm kind of leaning towards Friday. So just look for the announcement. We'll put that. We'll, we'll let everybody know. Uh, so let it be written. So Tim has decided Friday. We're doing it Friday. There you go. So we're going to do it on Friday afternoon at four o'clock, uh, and we'll so we'll just roll it out same time, uh, plop down, as it went on Friday. It's good. Um, Friday. All right, let's do it. Uh, let's do it Friday, and then uh, we'll let everybody know, and uh, back to it. So that's uh, check us out tomorrow at seven, and uh, Friday at four, and Saturday at ten, 
and do not forget to uh, Lamentations of the People is free on OBS today only, so snatch that. I feel like there's something huge I'm missing, but uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is. We we walked down memory lane. We walked down memory lane tonight with the 1970s. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure how, how we ended up there, but there you go. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks for showing up. Thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, I think we're going to do some uh, uh, metamorphosis alpha. Uh, close mouth. Wait, what? What's going on? I'm missing something. Metamorphosis Alpha, we, you should have gotten a new uh, booklet, book, 700-page book. Uh, but, um, and Egypt will continue to ship. Ah, there's something big. I don't know what it is. But I think we're, we're going to do Chick-fil-A today. My mom's in town, uh, and she, uh, in November, I don't know, I don't even know what's going on anymore. Just people, y'all are just shouting stuff, and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I don't know why Jason's covering his mouth and Jason's shouting or Chuck's shouting November. At any rate, <laughs> I'm out. Uh, you guys have a great rest of your evening and we will see you tomorrow and Friday and then we'll see you again Saturday for Chuck's game. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up. Thank you for the follows. Thanks for uh, the subs and all of that. And um, you'll have a great, what is today? When? Tuesday? you have a great rest of your week. Good God, I need, I need to go eat some dinner or something. All right.